Hello and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. The next United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP27, is about to take place in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. Against that backdrop, this week I'm finding out more about the Convex Seascape Survey, a major scientific initiative with the seabed at its heart. The ocean seabed is the world's biggest carbon sink, and one of the greatest unsolved scientific questions of our time is how does the ocean impact climate change? Blue Marine Foundation, the University of Exeter and Convex have partnered on an ambitious five-year global programme to discover what the world needs to incorporate the ocean into efforts to slow climate change. Vital research and accurate data will be collected and analysed, and the project will journey to the depths of the sea to quantify how seascapes thriving with life can absorb carbon and be an impactful part of the solution. Callum Roberts, Professor of Marine Conservation at the University of Exeter, is involved in this. Callum Roberts, Professor of Marine Conservation at the University of Exeter, is involved in this unique joint seascape project. He served as Chief Scientific Advisor on the BBC's flagship documentary series Blue Planet 2, presented by David Attenborough, and is Chief Scientific Advisor to Blue Marine Foundation. Callum, great to meet you. And of course, at such a critical time, climate change-wise. Certainly is. We are seeing the fastest rate of climate change for a very long time in planetary history. And at this time, it's happened before, of course. Climates have changed in the past due to natural causes, but this time it's caused by us. And climate change threatens our very existence. So we need to urgently respond to that. Do you think, Callum, the problem feels too huge for normal folk to take on? I mean, I lie in bed awake at night terrified about what a slight increase in temperature is going to do to the planet. And yet in some ways, and obviously I don't mean people like you, but I feel we're perhaps sleepwalking into something that's going to destroy our planet for our children's children. It will certainly be a different planet in the future, but what we do now is going to make a very big difference to our children's children. I think, you know, we have a lot of leverage. So actions that we take now to slow the rate of climate change, to reduce emissions, increase the capacity of the natural world to absorb carbon that we've already released, all of those actions will make a material difference to the well-being of future generations. And we need to act in a very urgent way if we're going to improve that outlook for people. I think if we don't act, the the world is very clear about what's going to happen. It's telling us through increased frequencies of wildfires, through melting glaciers and ice caps, through warming seas and desertification of the environment. That is the manifestation of climate change that we see all around us. And it's not pretty. It's going to get worse unless we act now. How are you feeling about the Seascape survey, which I'm really looking forward to hearing more about, and how game-changing do you hope it could be? Well, I think what we want to do is to try and find out how we make the ocean an ally in the fight against climate change. In dealing with climate change, there are two things that we need to do. One is to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we're producing, and the second is to try and draw down the greenhouse gases that have already been emitted. And in combination, this will definitely lower the peak of climate change that we're going to experience, and it will slow the rate at which those effects are going to manifest themselves. Lowering emissions is something that we are seeing lots of effort around the world to achieve, but I'm working really more on the increasing the uptake of carbon that's already been released, and nature can help us there. We know that if we start planting trees, then we're going to increase the amount of carbon that is in vegetation and in soils. And that has been a big part of the kind of initial response to trying to tackle climate change. It's embedded within the scenarios that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has produced. The most optimistic scenarios, the ones that hold the world to less than two degrees of warming by 2100, those all involve nature helping us to draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But most of those solutions are on land. We are thinking about 
forests. We're thinking about how to make agriculture less of a source of carbon dioxide emissions and methane emissions. But the ocean has been pretty much outside that process up to now. But the ocean is huge and it should be playing a role in our efforts to tackle climate change. We used to think of the world as seven-tenths sea and three-tenths land, and that's how it looks from space. But when you take into account the third dimension, which is the depth of the ocean, it probably occupies something like 97% of the volume of living space on Earth, which means that the living world of the ocean is profoundly important to the processes that keep the planet habitable and to our response to climate change. So what we want to do is to see how big is the ocean as a sink for carbon dioxide emissions and how can we turbocharge, if we can turbocharge, the rate at which the ocean is taking up carbon and storing it out of harm's way. Gosh, so many questions. I I don't even know where to start. Just in that answer alone, there are so many different things I want to pick up on. Let's start, though, with the fact that you talked there about the seabed being the world's biggest carbon sink. I mentioned that in the introduction. What exactly does that mean? Mud. (laughs) Mud is the big carbon sink. If you're on land, we know that the big carbon sinks are very organic matter-rich soils, for example, peat bogs store huge amounts of carbon that has accumulated over thousands of years. Forests store carbon in the living trees and the wood that has been laid down. But underwater, a lot of the carbon is stored in mud. And so it's trapped in those sediment deposits that have built up on the seabed over the course of thousands of years and are accumulating there as time goes on. So how can nature in terms of the seabed and the ocean help us? It does seem to have been perhaps an untapped resource in the past. Well, the ocean is not an untapped resource in some ways. So we've been exploiting the sea for a long time. We've been catching a huge amount of fish. We've been hunting marine wildlife like whales and seals and seabirds over uh, very long timescales, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years in some cases. Some of the ways in which we catch fish are very destructive of the environment. So when you drag a trawl net or a dredge across the seabed. It's an efficient way of capturing a lot of fish, but it's an inefficient way in that it's very unselective and we throw away a lot of what we catch using these methods. And it's also a destructive way of fishing because it does a lot of collateral damage. So you're destroying and converting seabed habitats to something else as you drag these gears around. So we've been doing this for hundreds of years now without giving it very much thought. But now we see that these methods could be very damaging, not just to fish stocks, but also to the ocean's carbon stores. If you want the ocean to store carbon efficiently and safely, what you need to do is to make sure that those carbon stores are not disturbed. When we burn heather to promote grouse shooting, for example, then that exposes the peat bog carbon to being released as carbon dioxide again, once re-released into the atmosphere. So you don't want to disturb a store once it's accumulated. But when you drag a trawl across the seabed, that is constantly stirring up the sediment. It's then raised in the water column and In that time, it can be reprocessed into carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide does either of two things. It can slow the uptake of more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, or if things are really bad, it will re-release carbon dioxide from the ocean to the atmosphere. The second thing is you want a healthy habitat that is capable of taking up carbon as fast as possible. And both of those things, both the security of the store and the rate at which new carbon is being taken up, are compromised by dragging trawls and dredges across the seabed. Because the wildlife that does the storage, you know, things that are capturing plankton from the overlying waters and tucking it away into the mud, those animals are being disrupted and destroyed by bottom trawls. So we don't know how much of a problem this is. We know it is probably very significant. And so that is really what we're going to look into in the Convex Seascape Survey, where we want to know 
how big a store of carbon there is on the world's continental shelves. That's the shallow seas down to about 200 meters deep that extend from the coasts of islands and continents. And we want to know, you know, where is the carbon? How much is there? Where did it come from? And is it vulnerable to disruption by people? And if it is, what can we do about it? And does the carbon absorption have any negative effect on the sea plants, the reefs, marine life? Can they live sort of happily, if you like, with the carbon absorption, provided it's not being disrupted by the fishing nets and things like that? So marine wildlife is naturally taking up carbon and tucking it away, just as plant life is taking carbon from the atmosphere and putting it into the soil. So if you like, the seabed is like underwater soil, and this soil has been disregarded by us for a long time. You know, it hasn't been taken seriously in the way that we take soil seriously on land because we're dependent on soils for fertility, for growing crops, and for raising animals. But underwater, we just drag our nets and trawls across it. We dig it up for harbors. We mine aggregate. We haven't really considered it at all as an asset. And that's what the Convex Seascape Survey really wants to do, is to look at the seabed as an asset and think about if we were to manage this differently, how could it benefit us more? Tell me about the kind of research you'll be doing, the data you'll be collecting. I gather you'll be journeying to the depths of the sea for some of that. It's really not my world at all, Callum, and I can't imagine what's going to go on scientifically, other than that it feels like this could be really significant and exciting. Well, we're bringing together a whole range of different disciplines in science to answer this kind of central, compelling question that we have about the ocean's value as a carbon sink. And that includes looking at all the historical information that has been gathered about the structure of the seabed around the world, figuring out where the hollows are that carbon could accumulate in over time, using oceanographic models that tell us how ocean currents and uh, seabed bathymetry, the depth of the sea, has changed since the end of the last ice age, and how those currents interact with the shape of the seabed to dictate where carbon is building up. We're going to go out and we're going to measure those places. We're going to see how much carbon is there. We're going to use molecular tools like environmental DNA sampled from those cores taken into the carbon deposits on the seafloor to figure out what produced that carbon. Was it from land-based sources, for example? Are there plants that were growing on land whose carbon has ended up in the sea? Is it marine habitats, things like salt marshes or mangroves or seagrasses? Is it seaweed? Is it the animals that live in the overlying waters? So we want to know where the carbon came from. You know, what is the biggest contribution and how is the carbon getting there? We also want to measure using experiments, both in the open ocean and in uh, Aquaria, to figure out how does disruption of that carbon happen by activities like trawling for fish? And how does that disruption affect the carbon store? You know, does it mean that if you uh, get up that seabed carbon, resuspend it into the water column, is that carbon then going to be re-released into carbon dioxide and become a problem for us? Or does it just get redeposited or not? We need to find that out through these kinds of experiments. We also want to look at how protecting areas of seabed change those processes and change the capacity of the seabed to store carbon. So is an undisturbed seabed better at storing carbon? Is it faster at storing carbon than one that is disturbed? So by answering these questions, we can figure out what we need to do if we need to change policies about how we use the ocean to promote the ocean's capacity to take up carbon from the atmosphere. It's a five-year research project, Callum. So does that mean five years of research and then some conclusions? Or does it mean two or three years of research and then hopefully bring in changes and change of policies that will help? Give us a sense of the timeline. Five years is not a long time to answer big questions. So we will work as fast as we can. But the process of building that understanding of getting really robust figures that will hold up to scrutiny 
that's going to take some time. I think that what we will see is that we will feed the information continuously out there into the public domain so that people can scrutinize our results, they can you know, stress test them, they can incorporate them into their thinking about how to change policies towards uses of the ocean. All of that will happen as rapidly as possible. But I'm expecting that some questions won't be answered until we get to year five of this project. It's fascinating to think that we've only explored, I think, about 5% of our ocean. That's really extraordinary, isn't it? It is. And, you know, that 5% is the really shallow bit and a bit of the deep sea. We haven't seen very much of the deep ocean because it's very hard to get there. And the average depth of the ocean is about 3.8 kilometers. So the pressures down there are immense. It's completely pitch black and it's very expensive to run submersibles and submarines down there that are able to see what is living there and how it goes about its life, you know. So we don't know nearly enough about how the ocean works. And I think the Convex Seascape Survey is aiming to really reveal more about the way that the continental shelves work. And it's a neglected part of the sea, I think, neglected by most people apart from the fishing industry and oil and gas and others who use it for industrial purposes. We interviewed Dee Kafari on the Convex Conversation, the record-breaking round-the-world yachtswoman who was the first woman to sail solo the wrong way around the world obviously against prevailing winds rather than taking a wrong turn. She was saying that at Point Nemo, when the closest human being to you is in the International Space Station, that if she cut open a fish, it would be contaminated with plastic. And a lot of that plastic obviously comes from the fishing nets too and pollution. I know you've specialised in fishing and we probably need to relook at how we fish and how we use the world's resources on that front as well. I know that's a whole other podcast, but you touched on the continental shelves a couple of times and how coastal waters can help. I read a statistic to say they could provide 6% of the carbon drawdown needed to slow the rising global temperatures to 1.5 degrees. And what brought that statistic to life for me was it said it was the same impact as closing down all the world's cement and chemical industries. That gives you a sense of how the ocean could help. Could we solve climate change without the ocean? Probably not. I don't think we can. And I think we'd be foolish to try because this is a problem that is global in scale. So we need to bring all parts of the world to be part of the solution. And I think by focusing all our efforts on land, it's convenient and it's easier, but it's also going to be less effective if we bring the ocean into that picture too. And that's why this project is so important. It's looking at the viability of doing that and finding the best ways. If it turned out that the world's fishing industries using these seabed contacting fishing methods, trawling and dredging, was causing a great loss to those carbon stores, then the policy change is very simple. We just have to greatly scale back the footprint of those fisheries and to move it away from the places where carbon is most at risk. So it's a very doable thing in a policy sense. That doesn't mean stopping fishing. It means fishing using methods that are less disruptive to carbon. And there are plenty of those around. How much of our underworld have you seen, Callum? Are you a scuba diver? Have you been down in vessels? I am a scuba diver. I have only been down to scuba diving depths at this point, but I hope to go down in submersibles before too much longer. But I love diving. I've been doing it since I was 20 years old, and I've been lucky enough to see many parts of the world. What's been your favourite and most special, do you think? It's always hard to say what is my most favourite, because a dive on a muddy seabed with incredible microscopic or you know, very small marine life, some of the most beautiful underwater photographs are taken in those environments by people who have an eye for beauty that is thumbnail size. But on the other hand, if you were looking for something which is truly kind of awe-inspiring, sets the heart racing, then you can't really be diving with hammerhead sharks in the Galapagos Islands where you're surrounded by these great animals which are just almost primordial in their indifference to you. They're majestic, they're beautiful, and they are completely at home. 
I've done a bit of bad snorkeling with giant turtles, which actually was amazing and great fun. Uh, I must try and find time to scuba dive because even though I'm a little bit claustrophobic, I know I'm really missing out. Lewis Pugh, UN patron of the oceans and extreme Arctic swimmer, is someone I know and admire, and I'm sure you know of him too. He spent the last 30 years risking his life swimming Arctic waters to highlight the alarming speed with which the polar ice caps are melting, something the Catlin Arctic Survey demonstrated. He's been swimming the Red Sea this month, much warmer waters than he's used to in his speedos and his cap, to highlight the effect a slight temperature rise would have on our coral reefs, again something the Catlin Seaview Survey showed. You studied coral reefs and wrote Reef Life. How devastating would a fraction of an increase in temperature be And how precarious is the future of coral reefs? Well, it could be terminal. And uh, that's one of the reasons why action on climate change is so urgently needed. Corals thrive and they build these magnificent reefs through a partnership with a microscopic seaweed called the zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae live within the tissues of the corals and they photosynthesize and they give the coral a superpower, which is to grow fast enough and lay down calcium carbonate, the basic ingredient of chalk, fast enough to create these reefs. But this relationship between the coral and the seaweed is incredibly temperature sensitive. And when you raise the temperature just one degree centigrade above their normal thermal maximum, then the partnership breaks down, it goes bad, and the corals have to get rid of the seaweed. But a coral that has no seaweed in its tissues is a starving coral. And so if the temperatures don't go back down again fast enough, then the coral dies. And that has happened in multiple events around the world, a couple of really serious ones in 1997, 98, and in 2015, 16, which caused mass mortality of corals. The first of those caused 90% of the corals to die in the Maldives in the middle of the Indian Ocean. The second one caused two thirds of the corals to die. So we are seeing an existential crisis for coral reefs. They've been recovering after these events, but the predictions are that the intervals between these periods of intense thermal stress are going to get shorter, and the intensity of those periods of stress is going to get greater. So coral reefs are really in the crosshairs of climate change, and that's why we urgently need to reduce the speed at which it's happening and reduce the peak when it comes and keep temperatures to less than one and a half degrees centigrade above the historical record. Can we do it, Callum? Is it realistic to do everything we need to to keep those temperatures where they need to be? I think with every passing week and month and year, it becomes less realistic. And that's why we need to come together as a world community to act fast. It's very disappointing when governments faced by, you know, fiscal crises immediately then abandon things like net zero, you know, we we have to go out and, you know, there's an energy crisis. So let's go out and dig up more oil and gas. and, And that isn't the solution. We've got to live within our means. We've got to constantly keep that within the frame, regardless of what other crises affect the world, politics must prioritize dealing with climate change. Otherwise, the future will be a much more hostile place for all of us. And just referring back there to the coral reefs, they're not just something beautiful to look at if you're lucky enough to dive or whatever. They are the world's richest marine ecosystem, aren't they? They really are vital. They are, and they provide incredibly useful services to various countries. You know, if you have a coral reef on your coast, that coral reef is providing food for the population, it's providing income from tourism. It could be protecting the very country that it surrounds. And so I mentioned the Maldives in the middle of the Indian Ocean. That country only exists because of coral. Corals built the entirety of the nation. They create and they sustain the islands that Maldivians live on. If the corals die, the Maldives is in deep trouble. 
We've had a taste of what it's like underwater in some of the most beautiful parts of the world. Thanks to the BBC's flagship series, Blue Planet 2, hosted, of course, by Sir David Attenborough. You were chief scientific advisor for that series. Tell us a little bit about that, what it was like and what you had to do. Well, you know, it's not as glamorous as it sounds. I more or less had to do a lot of talking and scrutinizing the storylines, thinking about what the science said about the scenes that were being filmed, making sure that the series was accurate, that there weren't misinterpretations coming in, and making sure that as well that environmental messages were being incorporated into the series. And I think it was groundbreaking as a series in that it kind of abandoned the tradition of not saying much about the problems affecting the world, to confront them within the series, within the programs, in a much more direct way. And I think that really resonated with the public. I mean, you can't go out and film the world and pretend that human impacts don't exist anymore. That's just airbrush nature, it's entertainment, and it isn't working. People need to understand the context in which nature exists these days. And need to understand what we need to do to allow it to thrive into the future. And so I think Blue Planet 2 was really groundbreaking in making that transition from the old model of, you know, if you see and enjoy nature, you're more likely to care about it. This is now saying, let's start looking at what's going on and how do we protect nature? I like your viewpoint of seeing our seas and our seabed as an asset. That's a very positive way of looking at it and an inspirational way of looking at it. I think the Seascape survey is going to be really exciting. And it's great that the university has partnered with Blue Marine Foundation, who will be featuring in the new year, and also, of course, with Convex. As you know, Stephen Catlin, the chairman of Convex, cares very much about climate change and has done a lot of investigation in this area. You've authored a book, well, in fact, you've authored lots of interesting books about how our seas are changing. And it's alarming to learn that they're changing faster and in more ways than at any other time in human history. Is that because of us, Callum? Is that because of the world's greed and insistence on wanting everything now and moving away from a more natural way of living? In a nutshell, yes, it's us. Throughout history, the ocean has inspired fear and awe and respect. We've looked at the sea and we've thought, this is a vast place. We are not in charge here. The ocean is in charge. But today, our influence on the planet has grown to the point where the ocean is now affected by us everywhere. Every place that we look in the sea from the remotest place, to the deepest abyss has the signs of human influence and it's inescapable and what's happening now is that influence has built up over time enough to start changing things in the sea dramatically we're seeing marine heat waves that are unprecedented in history which are causing all sorts of disruption to marine life like coral reefs but further afield too the melting of glaciers the, the ice sheets uh, collapsing into the ocean All of those things are ultimately traceable to us. We've completely transformed the wildlife that lives in the sea through hunting and fishing over hundreds, thousands of years even. So now we have to understand the influence that we have, the impact that we have, and we need to rein it in. We need to, you know, limit our capacity to change this environment. We need to give the ocean the respect that it deserves. As a scientist, does the fact that there is so much that we don't know about the ocean, so much to discover, so much to learn, is that what makes your work so fascinating? I think that's true of any piece of science is that the unknown is always a draw. It's always fascinating. But I think What I want to do, and particularly through the Convex Seascape Survey, is to make what we know more influential in changing the way that we look after the world. And so it's all about informing policy. It's using science to make better policies and to try and navigate our way through the difficult times that lie ahead, because things are going to get worse before they get better, inevitably. There is a peak 
up there in, in terms of the rate and extent of environmental change that we're going to have to deal with. We can use good policy, good science to reduce the size of the hip, but ultimately we are also going to have to adapt the way that we live on the planet to respond to the changes that are unavoidable. And so I think the way that our science fits into this is helping with that good policy to transition in a better way to a safer future. I think a policy is absolutely right and igniting the imaginations of all of us and making us all feel that we can be part of this. I was in Kenya a few months ago enjoying some Kenyan green beans from their garden at lunch and it suddenly struck me that I sometimes buy Kenyan green beans in the supermarket and there we were in this beautiful surrounding 6,000 miles away from home and I suddenly thought then about the carbon footprint what we're doing and how perhaps we should all go back to more my grandparents' times when they had an allotment and grew their veg and it didn't fly in aeroplanes and all that kind of thing. I know that sounds idealistic, but we've all changed our expectations. You look at Amazon deliveries, we expect things now on the day. Everybody has a part to play if we're going to succeed in this. And we have to succeed in it, don't we, Callum? Because there's no choice if we want a future. No, there is no choice. And the question is how fast we do it and how well we do it. Because change we must, the present trajectory is not sustainable. Just before we end, Callum, it'd be great to hear a little bit about you and how you ended up going down this path. Where did your interest to become a marine conservationist come from? Was it from being a young boy? Were you fascinated with that side of the world? I grew up living by the sea in the north of Scotland. And so the sea was always a big draw for me. And I would imagine an unbroken line of sea going all the way to exotic countries far afield that I'd never visited. I wanted to explore the world. I wanted to find out more about it. And so the sea was a natural part of that. I realized that by studying biology at university, I could become a scientist explorer. And by studying the sea, I could travel the world. So I've been very lucky. I started my science career studying the coral reefs of Saudi Arabia and visiting pieces of remote coast that nobody had explored before underwater. Since then, though, I've realized that people are changing the planet dramatically. And gradually, as my career progressed, I realized that we needed to be applying science to understand what our effects are on the environment and how to minimize those, how to live in balance with the natural world. And so that eventually became kind of my major focus in my career. I'm lucky enough that I have managed to train many students to go out and multiply the effort over time. So I see a bright future in some ways because we have so many talented people who are looking for ways to improve the relationship between people and environment. And that's what makes me optimistic about the future. And how excited are you about the Seascape project and playing a key role in it with Blue Marine Foundation and of course Convex too? Well, intellectually, it's a really exciting project. It brings together people from disciplines that don't normally mix very much. And I think all the exciting discoveries to be made in science lie at the sort of margins of where disciplines intersect with one another. So I'm looking forward to some great new insights into the way that the ocean works. And I'm hoping that will lead us to better ways of living in harmony with the sea. Callum, I hope the work you're doing with your university colleagues, Blue Marine Foundation and Convex goes well. Perhaps I can check in with you sometime next year and find out how it's all going and what the learnings have been so far. Would that be okay? That would be brilliant. You've been listening to Callum Roberts, Professor of Marine Conservation at the University of Exeter's Cornwall campus, Chief Scientific Advisor to Blue Marine Foundation and Chief Scientific Advisor on Blue Planet 2, talking about how critical our oceans are in conquering climate change. Callum is involved in the Convex Seascape survey and in the new year we'll be talking to George Duffield, co-founder of Blue Marine Foundation. Download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search the Convex Conversation on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week with another fascinating guest. Bye for now.